Audhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of Allah, the Beneficent and the Merciful. I ask salvation from Shaytan the Accursed. My dearest viewers, my brothers and sisters from all across the world, Assalamu alaikum jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessings, and the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you at all times. Welcome to the Ramadan show exclusively here on Imam Hussein TV with me, your host, Dr. Shabir Tijani. Inshallah, we'll have a great show lined up for you where we will be talking about many different things to be your one stop shop for the month of Ramadan. Inshallah, I would ask you to please send in your videos, your pictures, your blogs about how you spend this holy month so that we can show it and share it with the rest of the world. And finally, I would like to ask you to join us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and on YouTube onto which this show will be uploaded tomorrow. Before we commence on to the show, I would like to start off with a saying and a hadith from the Aymat al-Tahirin alayhim salam Because this is the birth of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam I wanted to do a quote from him. He says, do not rush to punish a sinner. Give him some respite, a chance for him to find a way of apologizing. Here the Imam has told us that the value of forgiveness and apology is very high in Islam. If you've made a mistake, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you time to ask for forgiveness. And as human beings, we should be caring towards other human beings. Forgive, because after all, that is what you'd want from someone else. And that's what we want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us only when you forgive others. So please bear this in mind as you prepare for this holy month and as you contemplate and reflect about the sayings from the Ayman al-Tahirin. During this episode, I want to talk about a specific personality from the Ahlul Bayt salam, that individual who we're remembering on this very day, and that's Hassan ibn Ali salam. Imam Hassan is the second Imam, the successor to Amir al muminin and he was born in Medina on the eve, on the night of the 15th of the holy month of Ramadan. His mother Fatima al Zahra salam, brought him to the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, on the seventh day in a silk shawl from heaven which Jibrail brought down to the Holy Prophet. He named him Hassan and did Aqiqah, the Aqiqah ceremony. It is said that Imam al-Hassan was the most similar to the Holy Prophet in his form, in his manner and in his nobility. Imam Hassan, the Holy Prophet on his deathbed, when Lady Fatima Zahra brought her two sons to him, she said, these are your two grandsons, give them something as an inheritance. The Holy Prophet replied, As for Hassan, he has my form and my nobility. As for Hussein, he has my generosity and my bravery. Anas ibn, Ab uh, Ab Anas ibn Malik said, No one was more like the Apostle of God, may Allah bless him, than Hassan ibn Ali, peace be upon them. Next we'll talk about the worship of Imam Hassan alayhi salam. When Imam Hassan, in his lifetime, we look through the narrations and look through his biography, we see that he performed the Hajj on foot 25 times. When he mentioned death, he wept. When he mentioned the grave, he wept. When he mentioned the resurrection, he wept. When he mentioned crossing the Sirat, he wept. When he mentioned the standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he fainted. When he mentioned paradise and fire, he, shock, he was in shock as a sick, sick person would be. He was very generous and charitable. He looked after the sick and the poor, the orphans and the widows. He mentioned Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all conditions, whether he was in a joyous mood or in sorrow, whether good times were happening or bad. When talking about Imam Hassan, we see that he's a man, a person of the highest 
value of ethics and morals of principles and therefore everyone during his time respected him the Imam was loved by everyone and everyone loved to associate with him everyone loved to hear him speak about these good values and these good morals there are a few stories that I want to share with you Imam Hassan despite having a very high social rank he was very kind and considerate to his people there was once a story where there are a group of poor people sitting down eating bread and they invited the Imam they said oh apostle of the Prophet, oh Apostle of Allah, sorry, come and join us to lunch. He dismounted his camel and he said, Indeed, Allah does not love the proud. And he began eating with them. After that, he invited him, them and gave them food and clothes. This is just one of the examples of the generosity of the Imam. I want to just give you a few more examples. In narrations, it is said that once a man came to the Imam and asked him for a specific need, the Imam gave him double of what he wanted. And there were some people sitting there who asked him, why did you do that? The Imam said, Do you not know that doing good should be done without request? As for him whom gave you the request, you give him after what he has lost, face. As in, you give him dignity. Even though he's asked you, by asking you he's losing dignity, so what you give him does not allow him to lose face. He continues, he says, He may spend his night restless and sleepless, he rocks between despair and hope. He does not know whether he will face a sad answer or glad success. He comes to you while he shakes all over and his heart is afraid of you. Then if you meet his need through losing face, that losing face would be greater than what he's obtained from you as a favor. Again, the Imam, another example of his generosity. He once saw a black boy, a servant. He was eating a piece of bread and he was giving a piece of bread to a dog. The Imam said to him, what has made you do this? The boy answered, he said, I feel, ashamed of my, I feel ashamed when I eat this bread and my dog is just watching me. Imam said to him, do not leave your place until I come back. The Imam went to the master of this boy and he bought the boy and he took the boy to a garden that he lived in. He freed the boy by buying him and made him possess that garden. Again, we see the generosity of the Imam. He gave, he gave more than what was required. When we talk about the outstanding merits of the Imam, we, we say or we, we find in narrations that the Imam is known as the Lord or the Master of the Youth of Paradise. He was one of the four people that the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, took on the event of Mubahila. He was one of the five whom the Prophet covered in the cloak. He is obviously one of the twelve Imams, one of the Apostles of God. And he was amongst those who were purified from the sins, as the Holy Qur'an says. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, loved him and asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to love those who also love him. From this I want to move on to another topic because it's closely linked to Imam Hassan. As we know, Imam Hassan had a very close relationship with his brother Imam Hussein. And I want to talk a little bit about brotherhood. Obviously brotherhood, as brothers, when you're born and you're brought up, you are by each other's side, you take each other's favor, you look after each other, you listen to each other, you comfort each other, you become like best friends. Brotherhood, we've been shown, is a fantastic example of how we as human beings should encourage our children and even ourselves, if we are brothers, we should try and make good and strong bonds with them because they're essentially our closest friends, not only are the family members, but because of the age gaps and because of the closeness in ties, they should be one of the closest people to us in our lives. We look through history, we see many examples of this. We see the relationship between Imam Hassan and Hussein. We see the relationship between Abbas and Imam Hussein on the uh, day of Ashura. And then we look at the relationships between, um, for example, Ali Akbar and Imam Sajjad. And these relationships we can see throughout history and throughout time how important it is to have close links with one's brother. That's why within our societies when I see that brothers are separated, they don't talk to each other, I feel that the moral fabric of society is being split apart. Because as family members, as brothers, as friends, you can do so much and build a community together. Inshallah, I hope that you all pay heed to the stories of the Aimma. There are just a few tips that I want to give you about how to 
have strong relationships with your brother, how to build upon that relationship. Firstly, and the most important thing is, we're told that in Islam we should respect the elderly. And the elderly are told that they should lo show love towards the young. And that goes the same for brotherhood. As brothers, you should not treat one more superior than the other. This goes for parents as well. When you're bringing up your children, try and show them love equally. Don't treat one better than the other. Secondly, as brothers, try to show love and respect for each other. The younger brother should show respect to the elder brother because he's elder than him. He gives him more respect because of his wealth of experience, his wisdom. The older brother should show love and care towards the younger brother. He should be a protector for the younger brother. And when this happens and you don't treat one above the other, you get a level of mutual respect. Secondly, as two brothers, you should try and endeavor to do the same activities together, draw on each other's strengths, try and counteract or, co or compensate for each other's weaknesses. In society, try and stand up together, go to the same places together, be seen together, so that people know that you're from the same root, from the same background, from the same family. Next. When it comes time to having friends, try and spend time together with the same friends. Try and grow up together, doing the same things together. Inshallah, you will appreciate each other's value when you do that. Finally, and most importantly, Inshallah, for those of you who do not talk to your brothers, who have become distant from your brothers, those of you who don't have good interaction with your brothers, try and make this month of Ramadan a clean slate. Try and make it a new start. Try and make contact with them, apologize, ask them for forgiveness for any shortcomings. And inshallah, invite them to your house if you have a house. Invite them to have lunch with you, dinner with you. Invite them to talk with you, interact with you. And inshallah, when you do that, you will see that the roots of your own being become stronger. You remember your background, your foundations. And as brothers, you can do so much to support each other, not only socially, not only emotionally, but financially, uh, through, the, through your own strength, physically you can support each other. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent brothers down as a blessing for you. And this goes for sisters as well. Every brother or sister that you have is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a specific reason why they've sent that person down for you. So you can support each, each, each other. You can be each other's backbone and each other's moral um, uh, support. Inshallah, I pray that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to become stronger not only as a society but between brothers as well. And inshallah, if we do that, we form the basic fabric and the basic morals of society. We show examples to our children and to the young of how to behave with one another, to behave, how to behave with brothers. And inshallah, as they grow, they'll, fi they'll find a galvanized and solid foundation for the community. Inshallah, it is only then can we be called a community which has good standing, a community that is ready for the reappearance of the awaited Imam alayhi salam. Imam Ali ibn Musa al rida alayhi salatu wassalam has said, Someone who recites one verse from the Book of Allah, the Mighty, the Glorious, in the month of Ramadan, is like one who has recited the entire Qur'an in the other months. Today, as we travel through the world and we look at how different people from different backgrounds, from different cities and different countries in the world prepare for the month of Ramadan, we also see how they prepare their day-to-day -day lives, their day-to-day -day activities, things like school and work, um, time for iftar, and how these vary from different parts of the world. And inshallah, today we'll be going to Toronto. Toronto is set in the heart of Canada and is one of the biggest and most diverse populations that there is. There are many Muslims from different backgrounds, such as Iraq, 
um, such as the Khoja community, such as the Iranian community, and many others. And they tend to form the crux of the Shia community within the city of Toronto. Obviously, they have their own centers, and each center works in a slightly different way, as it goes with the tradition and cultures of that particular race. Inshallah, I'll be talking a little bit about the information that I've got from the Khoja community as well as the Iraqi community. And inshallah, I'll tell you a little bit about what they do. Obviously, as Canada is a non-Muslim country, the working hours don't really change too much, and school continues as usual. But the people try to make use of the time that they have outside these hours in order to make the most out of this month. People, after they come back from work, they usually get together with their families. They have the iftar at home, after which they go to the mosque for majlis. It depends on what time of the year it is. If it's very late, I'm sorry, if iftar is very late on in the day, the majlis is usually before the time of iftar. And if iftar is very early in the evening, then they usually have majlis after iftar. Most centers in Canada don't actually have iftar served within the community centers. I know for a fact that the Khoja community in, in Toronto, in Canada, they have the iftar done at special times during the month, especially during the big occasions such as um, wafat or wilada. And other than that, the people generally try, try to eat at home with families, with their local communities. And also Toronto has a wonderful array of different shops which sell halal food, so people do go out to restaurants to eat food. During the amal night, the community comes together they do the amal together, they pray the dua together. And it brings a sense of unity, a sense of kinship and a bond between different members of the community. Also, the other thing that's interesting with Toronto, due to the large population, I know in the Khoja community, it's many, many thousands of people. And what happens is that they try to get the kids involved. The way they do this is by holding classes. They also have competitions during the month of Ramadan. And sometimes, depending on what time of year Ramadan falls, they also hold um, short courses, they have things like um, three or four day retreats for the young children where they can learn about Islam and do day to day things such as activities and sports, especially if it falls during the time of their holidays. In Toronto, there are majlis which happen in English as well as the local dialect or the mother tongue of the community. And this is helpful for the youth there because as the youth are brought up in the West and they're brought up in the English culture. English is a very important language for us to use within the centers and especially for the people there to use within their centers so it can attract the youth and the youth can understand what is being said. Inshallah, I pray and I hope that you can send in your videos as well from around the world, from wherever you are so we can see how you prepare your day-to-day -day lives, your iftar, your work, your school and so that we can also broadcast it on our channel and inshallah, let the rest of the world see how your preparation for this month varies from theirs and it will help to build a sense of brotherhood and kinship between the Shia population and inshallah we can also get a good idea of exactly how practices vary from place to place with one goal and that being the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Dearest viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace and blessings of Allah be upon each and every one of you We pray for the protection of Allah to be upon each and every one of you, our dearest viewers Stay tuned with us as we go inside the markets of the holy city of Karbala to show you the atmosphere of the holy month of Ramadan in the holy city of Karbala Brothers and sisters, I have one of the brothers here. He's one of the store owners here in one of the markets of the holy city of Karbala. 
I will ask him a few questions. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam, Habib wa rahmatullah. Mungkin nitarufna bhadartak wa tishrahna an ajwa madinat Karbala bshahar Ramadan al-Mubarak? Naam, hadarti rasul hadiyya wa al-malabis al-rijaliyya fi al-mujamma al-kawthar. Wa an shahar Ramadan, shahar al-khair wa al-ta'a wa al-qufran wa shahar al-baraka wa al-ajwa fiya halwa wa latifa wa al-rizq khair min Allah wa aman yani. Ma ku la da'i shemna wa la ay shakhs kaan wa idha ay shi. والحمد لله الأجواء خير وخير من الله ونعمة نعمة فضيلة فضلاء الشهر رمضان يعني الحمد لله الشكر. Brother Rasul is congratulating you and the Islamic Ummah on the holy month of Ramadan and he's saying that the holy month of Ramadan the atmosphere here in the holy city of Karbala is so special we do not have any problem here nor nor ISIS nor other terrorists and the life is going on. And uh, they have, uh, they, they've opened their stores during the holy month of Ramadan without any problem. Uh, Rasul, ممكن تتفضل لنا عن وضعية عملكم شهر رمضان وشين اختلاف عن بقية أيام السنة؟ أي نعم شهر رمضان يختلف من بعد الأيام الأخرى يعني يعني شهر رمضان نجي ورا الفطور من بعد الفطور إذا نتأخر إلى الوحدة إلى ثنتين بالليل إنزين وشهر رمضان يعني أول العشرة الأولى تختلف عن العشرة الثانية والعشرة الأخيرة تكون أفضل وأحسن من باقي الأيام والشغل بها أكثر لكودن يتغرب على العيد يعني المبارك والشغل يصير خير من الله والحمد لله شكر ما أشياء uh, I ask the brother Rasul about their working time and the working hour during the holy month of Ramadan he's saying that uh, during the normal days of the year we usually open from morning till uh, after the dusk prayers but in the holy month of Ramadan uh, due to the fast, uh, they open their stores after the dusk prayer and after the iftar and they stay open until late at night, uh, 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. The, the first decade of the holy month of Ramadan, they stay here uh, until 1 and 2. But and the, the last decade of the holy month of Ramadan, when we come closer to the Eid, uh, they stay open later uh, for the people of the Karbala to come and buy their stuff for the, for the day, days of the Eid. In today's medical and health tips, inshallah, I want to start a new series. The series will be over a few shows, and I want to call it the stages of life. Obviously, with the stages of life, we'll talk about different elements of life itself. And inshallah, today I want to start off with childhood. Obviously, childhood can be defined in many different ways by many different people, but for myself, I want to talk about childhood from birth up until adolescence. And inshallah, the plan is to number one, tell you a little bit about different problems that the children face at each stage of, the, of life um, up to adolescence. Secondly, I want to talk about common conditions that you may face. And number three, I want to give general lifestyle advice and general health tips for parents especially who have young children. Things like nutrition, things like um, how to help them maintain social circles. And um, inshallah, I'll also talk about what to do if you're concerned about any part of their development. First, when children are born and you have babies, it is said that birth is the most dangerous time for any human being. It is the time when most of the human beings tend to be fine and, and don't have any medical problems, but there are a few who have some concerns. It's very important that if at birth, even if things have gone well, but after a few days you've noticed some concerns, it's important that you go and see your GP. So we're talking about things like if your baby is not wet, wetting its nappies properly, if it's not passing stool properly, if it's um, yellow in color, which could indicate that it's jaundiced. It's very important that you go and see your GP because there are certain conditions that babies can have at birth, but they do not manifest themselves until, until a few days or few weeks of life. In Great Britain, we have baby checks. So a baby will normally or, or, or generally be seen after 24 hours of life by the general practitioner. Usually it's at least 24 hours of life or a little bit later, maybe 48, 72 hours of life. And usually they have a checkup, make sure that the heart's okay, make sure there's no other obvious abnormalities, 
make sure that there is no evidence of any spina bifida. Spina bifida is a condition where you can get the spine which, which isn't sitting within the vertebral column. And as a result, it bulges out and protrudes. And usually you'll see the GP or the doctor run their hand over the spine of the baby and have a feel to see if there's any protrusions. So as doctors, we check after 24 hours to make sure the baby's fine. However, we do a second check in six weeks. And the reason we do that are for several reasons. When a baby is born, the circulation of the baby when it's in the womb is different to our circulation in adulthood and during childhood. Basically, when a baby is born, it has many different openings in the body, i.e. the blood has shunts. So the system bypasses certain things. For example, in um, a baby that's in the womb, it doesn't require its lungs because it's not breathing. So as a result, it has a shunt. And that's called a patent foramen ovale. And that shunt exists between the two top chambers of the heart. And normally when a baby is born, because of the change in pressures in the lungs, when the baby cries for the first time, it expels a lot of fluid from its lungs. And as it expands the lungs, when it expands the lungs, because of the increase in volume, the pressure drops. And when the pressure drops, the pressure in the lungs and the pulmonary system, the blood vessel, blood vessels in the lungs drop and as a result the pressure in the right side of the heart drops and that um, opening in the heart closes because of the pressure changes. Other um, openings in the uh, body include um, what we call a patent ductus arteriosus which is a connection from the heart system and the blood in the heart system to one of the major blood vessels in the body called aorta. And the third one is a patent foramen, uh, sorry, a uh, patent uh, ductus venosum, which is essentially an opening which bypasses the liver. Again, as a baby is in the womb, it doesn't require its liver to be used much because the food or the um, nutrients it's absorbing is through the mother rather than through the gut. So as a result, the blood system bypasses the liver as it's not required for metabolism of the food. And as a result, the babies, when they're born, go through different stages where these ducts close and when all three of them are closed, that's when um, the system is fully engaged. However, the first change that you get in a newborn is the closure of the hole in the heart, the patent foramen ovale. The pressure in the right side of the heart drops, but it doesn't drop suddenly, it drops very gradually. So when you hear the heart of a newborn baby after one day, sometimes they don't have a murmur. But that's why we have a six-week check, because sometimes holes in the heart, which are not supposed to be there, manifest themselves after a few weeks of life. Because of the pressure changes being very slow, after the first day you don't hear these changes because the, a hole in the heart, the murmur that you hear is caused by turbulence in the blood system. And as a result, we hear these changes after six weeks. So all in all, it's very important that number one, you have your checkups in time. And number two, if there's any abnormalities that you as a parent note, because don't forget, after one day, if the baby's fine, it doesn't mean there's no problems. It just means that there was nothing manifesting itself for that particular time. So it's very important to go and see your GP if you're concerned about anything. Secondly, it's very important that babies have the immunizations. Obviously, the immunizations are given after many studies have been carried out in the past. Babies are in, immunized against things like measles, mumps, rubella, against specific types of, um, of meningitis, of pneumonias, and as a result, they're, when they're immunized, they tend to lead healthy lives after that, and they don't get these very nasty infections. So it's very important that you give them the right in immunization at the right time of their lives. Thirdly, regarding feeding a baby, it's very important that they're fed regularly. If you notice that they're not feeding very well, then it's important that you flag this up to your general practitioner, especially with really young babies. The first signs of something not being quite right, an infection, is the fact that the baby becomes either doesn't feed very well or it becomes floppy and lethargic. The cries may sound different, it may become more muted or cry more. It's very important to subtly notice any differences and go and see your doctor if you're concerned about anything. Finally, I just want to talk about um, breathing problems. This is not necessarily in newborn babies, but in babies who grow up a little bit, maybe young, sort of maybe 12-month-old babies or toddlers. And they usually have problems during the winters. So Usually lung conditions such as bronchiolitis cause issues with their breathing. And if you think that their breathing is very difficult, you should go and see your general practitioner. They can give them antibiotics, give them nebulizers, which will help them to breathe better. In childhood, it's very important to try and understand what 
symptoms are worrying, what symptoms are concerning, especially for parents. In young children who I've mentioned may have wheezing or may have breathing difficulties. If you see your children really struggling to breathe, if you find that they're extremely wheezy, go and see a doctor straight away because that could be one of the first signs that something seriously is wrong. Other signs to look out for is things like recession of the lining of the lungs, so the, the chest wall. If you're finding recessions and parts of it are sinking in when they're breathing, that's a bad sign. And also, you look at the nose, and if there's flaring of the nostrils, there's again a sign that they're struggling to breathe and to maintain the um, movement of air in their airways. Other signs are more systemic, so things like poor feeding, inability to um, carry on with day-to-day -day life. So if, they find, if you find that they're extremely drowsy, extremely floppy, they're not feeding well, if they're not weeing or if they're not passing stool, again, all of these are signs of concern and you must go and see a doctor if any of these signs are manifesting themselves. As children go up, grow up, they tend to become healthier. So the most difficult times are during the first couple of years of life and then after that they tend to be more like children and they, they grow up and they have different needs and their health conditions are different. So more common conditions of childhood are things like chicken pox. And with that, those are self-limiting conditions. And if they are concerned about anything, you should go and see your doctor, but usually they tend to calm down by themselves. The main thing about young children is more the social side of things. As they grow up, they need to have a good social environment, a good social network. As a parent, your duty is not only to cater for their physical well-being, so things like food and nutrition, but also get them involved with clubs at school, for example, where they can express themselves socially, make friends, learn the art of social interaction, because this in turn will allow them to become a full and more complete human being as they grow up. Children are very impressionable, so they'll learn things very quickly. And it's important that it is at this age that they start learning. So if you want them to learn specific arts or specific things in life, now is a good time to get them to start learning. The next thing it's important to think about is nutrition. Obviously, this changes from time to time during life and during childhood as well. In newborn babies, nutrition is different and the priorities are different. As the children grow up and they wean off mother's milk or um, milk generally, the nutrition again, their priorities are different. And then as they grow up through young childhood again, it's important to provide the right sort of nutrition. So we'll talk about newborn babies. Studies have shown that in newborn babies, the best sort of nutrients to give them, the best way of feeding them is via breastfeeding. The reason being is that m the mother has all the nutrition that's needed and they can pass it on to the baby. And as a result, the baby will require, not require as much nutrition from artificial sources. And breast milk is found to have the best form of nutrients within it. So if you can, try and breastfeed your newborns. However, some mothers find this very difficult. And that's understandable because not all mothers are the same, not all children are the same. And this can obviously cause a child not to take well to breastfeeding. And if that's the case, then that's fine. There are other um, formulas out there that you can use in order to try and give your child the best nutrition that they need. Thereafter, when a child is being weaned off milk onto other things, it's important that you start off by giving them semi-solids first. So things like yogurt, and there are specialist baby foods that are made, pureed foods, in which they get the nutrition that they need, but at the same time, they're not having to eat and chew very hard food, and they can digest the food easily. Thereafter, as they grow up and they get into young childhood, up towards adolescence, that's when you need to give them food in order for them to grow, for their minds to grow. And it is at this stage you try and give them food which is high in vitamins and minerals. So fruit is very important. Vegetables, again, especially green vegetables, which is a good source of iron. Again, give that to the children. It's very important to have a varied diet. And inshallah, I've talked about this in a previous episode, so I won't go too much into it. But try and give your child the best nutrition that they can at this age. One thing I would mention is giving them um, omega foods that are rich in omega-3. So things like oily fish, like salmon and mackerel is very useful. Inshallah, if you look at the episode where I've talked about nutrition, give them the food that will give them a balanced diet. And inshallah, they will grow up very healthy and have the nutrition they need in order to help their mind grow and their bodies to grow. Next with child, it's, it's important to get them ready for adolescence, get them ready for adulthood. Obviously in children, 
you're not expecting them to become adults straight away. So they go through this phase in adolescence and in their youth, in their teen years. And it's, order to, it's very important for you to prepare them for those years because it's said that after the age of 13, if your child doesn't have good intrinsic values, if they don't have a good basis, a good fundamentals, then after the age of 13, they might be very difficult to control and rein in. So as a parent, it's very important for you to try and get your children to make good friends, interact socially with good company, and learn the art of social interaction, teach them good morals. Inshallah, we'll be talking about parenting in some of the episodes in this series. So I don't want to go too much into the spiritual and the moral side of parenting and the, and the roles of parents. But essentially, what you want to do is get, encourage them to attend social classes, encourage them to play sports, because it's important to allow them to grow in a variety of different ways, mentally, by giving them the right foods, by stimulating them mentally, especially in schools, and by doing work with them at home. Stimulating them physically by allowing them to do sports and also do other activities with their friends. And thirdly, stimulate them socially because children who by the age of teens and by the age of adolescence who haven't had good social interactions tend to grow up not having that social interaction, that ability to interact socially. And as a result, they have many problems, many psychological problems as they grow up. They're unable to make friends and they get into a downward spiral which can include things like depression and anxiety. So it's important that you give your child a facet, uh, many facets of growth and allow them to develop themselves by doing this. Finally, I just want to mention one, one other thing, that with young children especially, it's important that you keep an eye on them. Obviously, in this world that we live in, it's very easy to just let your children go and do what they want to do and not keeping an eye on them. It's very important that you keep an eye on what they do in school, for example. Make sure that their grades are up to scratch, for example. Make sure that they are interacting socially with their peers. Speak to the teachers if there's any concerns. Obviously, if there are any social concerns and if the children aren't developing well in school, there are other conditions such as autism which may be of concern. So it's important to flag that up early so the children can go and have the right treatment that they need. And inshallah, if we do this, then our children will grow up to be healthy individuals spiritually, mentally, physically, socially. And that's the aim of our society as a whole and our aim as adults. Inshallah, I hope that this segment has been useful for you. You can take away some learning lessons and inshallah, I hope you build up upon these so that we can have children, youth, that are able to call themselves the servants of the Ahlul Bayt and who can grow up and make our community go from strength to sp from strength to strength and expand insha'Allah. One day a man from Syria, Salam Hassan, peace be upon him, riding his horse and started insulting him. Imam Hassan, peace be upon him, did not reply anything, did not say anything to the man. When the Syrians stopped, Imam Hassan, peace be upon him, proceeded towards him and after cheerfully greeting him, he said, Old man, I believe you are a stranger. Maybe you have confused me with someone else. If you ask for forgiveness, it is granted to you. If you ask for a means of transportation, we shall provide it for you. If you are hungry, we shall feed you. If you are in need of some clothes, we shall clothe you. If you are deprived, we shall grant you. If you are being sought, we shall, we, we shall give you refuge. If you, are, if you have any need, we shall fulfill it for you. And if you wish to proceed with your caravan, then let you be our guest. When the man heard the words of Imam Hassan, peace be upon him, he cried and said, I testify that you are Allah's heir on his earth. Allah surely knows to whom he assigns his message. You and your father were the most hated people and hated creatures in my heart, but now you are the most beloved creatures to me. The man then d directed his caravan and became the guest of Allah Hassan, peace be upon him. Inshallah, in today's episode, as we remember 
the light of the eyes of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Lady Fatima, Imam Hassan alayhi salam, I want to present a poetry, a poem, a nasheed, which is dedicated to this personality. It's called A Hassan, and it's been written by myself and my brother Abbas. Insha'Allah, we hope that you listen to it and learn something about the life of this great personality. He is our he is second our leader second from leader all the from imams, all the and, we imams and we are sending our, our greetings and, and we're sending our salams. We are yours, O oh, our, our master. We will always say in, in every second, second, every minute, every hour of the day. He is the guiding light of all the mu'mineen. He'll keep us all on. The path of our deen Our Hassan has come down From paradise Love of Muhammad Light of Hayda's eyes Your face shines out brighter than the Brightness of the sun Cause there is no example Greater than you, O oh Hassan The beloved son of Ali and Fatima in our darkest in our nights darkest is our, our guiding star for him for this entire universe, universe was made we pray we will always will be in his shade our son has, has come, has down, come down, down from paradise, paradise. love of love Muhammad, Muhammad. Light of Hayda's eyes, love of Muhammad, light of Hayda's eyes. Imam Ali ibn Musa al rida alayhi salatu wassalam has said, Someone who recites one verse from the Book of Allah, the Mighty, the Glorious, in the month of Ramadan, is like one who has recited the entire Qur'an in the other months. As we conclude another episode of the Ramadan show, I would like to leave you with a final few words. Something to ponder over and think over. Something that you can take away with you. And inshallah, use in your everyday life. As it's the birth of Imam al Hassan, I wanted to think of something about patience. And as a keen person who has a, an interest in philosophy, I read the works of many of the philosophers, the great philosophers of our time. And one of them is Aristotle. And one of my favorite sayings from Aristotle is, patience is bitter, but its fruit is sweet. And that's so true of many walks of life. Those people who are patient and persistent often find that good things come to them. If we use the life of Imam al Hassan salam and see where he uses patience in order to overcome his enemy, where he uses patience to acquire what's best in this world and in the hereafter, where he uses patience to guide us Insha'Allah, if we pay heed to these guidance, these advices, we can move forward in life, not only individually, but as a community at large. I would like to once again thank you for watching, and once again would like to ask you to send in your videos, your pictures, your blogs, so we can air them, and the rest of the world can see how you prepare during this month of Ramadan. Once again, I would like to ask you to please join us on social media, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And finally, Please don't forget to pray for us in your supplications. And inshallah, pray, pray for the whole of the Muslim Ummah, especially those who are in need, those orphans and those widows. Finally, don't forget to pray for the most important dua of them all, and that is to pray for the reappearance of the awaited Imam. Salam. With these final words, I wish to bid you farewell. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.